What's going on guys? Today I'm uh, bringing you a different kind of video series uh, that I'm going to be starting and it's uh, you know it's kind of different than what I've had before but I'm really excited about it and it's called Playing to Win uh, based off this book titled Playing to Win by David Serling. The author here is very important because it's another book titled Playing to Win and it's an erotic novel so you have to imagine how that conversation went down at Books a Million whenever I was inquiring about the book. Anyway so this book has been uh, referred to as the competitive gamers bible and for a really good reason it goes into a lot of the uh, like theory that goes into uh, competition and competing at a high level in anything really uh, not just esports it, it gives um, examples from like poker and chess and you know all kinds of different areas of life but the author David Serlin is a uh, like a Street Fighter 2 player a pro player so he really he really knows what he's talking about and it's a great read i recommend this to anybody who wants to do anything competitively at all in fact i go to tournaments all the time and i say there's a book called playing to win you need to read it you can find the pdf online for free if you look it up uh by the way i'll also leave a link like an affiliate link in the description if you want to uh, have a physical copy or just support the channel or the author uh, you can check that out, but you don't have to. Um, the whole reason why I wanted to make this series, though, is that I recommend this book to like literally every human being I meet. But you already know that like zero percent of human beings have ever read a book that was recommended to them, and I think this information is too valuable um, for people not to know just because they don't want to read it. So uh, I'm going to be going through this book and uh, breaking down some of the contents that are in here. And there are basically six sections, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there's six sections of this book. Uh, the Beginner's Guide, Intermediate's Guide, The Art of War, which is where uh, he breaks down ideas that Sun Tzu has and applies it to competitive gaming. That's really cool. Uh, play Styles, Advanced Player's Guide, and lastly, Elite Player's Guide. And so I want to do a video uh, talking about each one of these particular sections. So the first video I'm doing today is over the beginner's guide and also the prologue, but that's like two pages long or something. So I'm, like, I'm lumping that into the beginner's guide. And uh, a lot of this stuff might seem like kind of common sense stuff that you don't need expert advice to know. But you know, it's the beginner's guide. It's uh, only going to get more advanced from here. And so uh, just bear with me through this one because uh, as we go on, it's gonna get more and more interesting. But without further ado, let's talk, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about these words. So it starts off with a quote and there are like quotes like in between paragraphs like throughout the whole book. And I just wanna read the quotes to you because I think they're really interesting and thought provoking. So it says, it's a Sufi prop proverb and it says it cannot be found by seeking but only seekers shall find it so just think about that just think about that a little bit pretty much the whole prologue is about uh it's like a disclaimer it says like hey this is these people like this is what my audience is and this is what my audience isn't and this book might not actually be for you um and it also says that like the second idea in here is that competition and competitive gaming does teach you valuable life skills, which I think is actually a hundred thousand percent true. I think that uh, competing at a high level in anything teaches you a lot about yourself and other human beings. Um, that's really great for personal development. But anyhow, so he starts off like this. He says, imagine a majestic mountain nirvana of gaming. At its peak are fulfillment, fun, and even transcendence. Most people could care less about this mountain because they have uh, other life issues that are more important to them and other peaks to pursue. So that's a really good point. And it's a really strong point they need to think about is that like, there are all these other things that you can do with your life besides pursue competitive gaming. Like you could uh, be a professional musician, you could be a uh, like a fine chef, you could be a lawyer, a doctor, you could build a family. There are a lot of things you can do 
and gaming is just one of them and arguably isn't even a very good one but you know some people want to climb this mountain of gaming and so he's he sets aside like three different qualities of people he says there are the people that are heading towards different mountain peaks besides gaming the book isn't for you he says uh there are people who are already like on the right track and don't need help and so the book isn't necessarily for them however most of those people who are kind of headed up the mountain to success in gaming at, like in competitive gaming um they only think they're headed up the mountain and actually they're trapped in some low valley that they don't even know that they're trapped in and um some of the ideas in this book are going to help them me get out of and that's who the book is really for and he says that he says really don't get rubbed the wrong way by all this talk because like a lot of people assume that he wants to apply competitive gaming to everyone but he doesn't you know if you've got some other pursuit in life that's fine go for it because you've got a finite amount of time in the world and um, you have to commit a lot of it if you want to uh, be very good at anything including gaming and so if this isn't your thing, it's not your thing, so don't get mad if this isn't, isn't your thing, basically is what he's saying here. How much of this like competitive gaming stuff actually applies to real life? He has, he has the question, because games are sharply defined by rules, and life isn't. In games, you can explore the quote-unquote extreme corner cases, and like that's fundamentally what competing at a high level is about, but in life, you can't necessarily do that because it's often socially ex unacceptable, morally wrong, and in some cases illegal. You know, there, there are still life lessons to be had and very valuable ones at that. And that's, that's really true. And I'm gonna interject some of my own thoughts on that last sentiment because like, the thing about competitive gaming is that it forces you to be really honest with yourself about like where you are what your skills are, what your weaknesses are, how you're going to overcome it. Um, if you don't have like a zero sum game to tell you finitely like, yes, you're doing well or no, like you just lost, then um, you might never be faced with having to be honest with yourself. And a lot of people aren't so they spend their whole life acting like they're still in high school, and I, I think it's a great way to grow as a human being to play competitive games. Let's get back to uh, let's get back to the book. So moving on from the prologue, we get into uh, the beginner's guide, and it starts with the introduction. And here's it. the first paragraph is one sentence long. It's not even a long one. It says, "I am here to teach you to win." And that's really a thesis for this whole entire book. I'm here to teach you to win. Then he goes on to challenge the reader to please accept the information that you're getting as truth. There's a quote at the bottom that says, human beings who are almost unique in having the ability to learn from the experience of others are also remarkable for their apparent disinclination to do so. And you know, for the last like four or five years of my life, I've been really discovering how like shockingly true that is because like everybody asks for advice everybody wants advice on everything but you notice that nobody ever takes your advice if you try to help them out even if they know something intellectually it's really hard for people to actually take something to heart like what somebody else says without them like living through the experience and learning it for themselves first that's really important here because um, when we get into like in the intermediate guide especially, when we get into later sections of the book, they're gonna be pills that are hard to swallow for some people and you're going to wanna reject the ideas because um, it, it'll turn your worldview upside down a little bit, but rejecting the ideas isn't going to help you improve. You just have to accept that this is true because he's got the ethos of being a very strong Street Fighter II player and so he's gone through like all this learning on his own so please just accept this is like the way it is so then he says why win at games i've got a couple of 
paragraph about this. And he goes on to say that, you know, zero sum games give you like a measurable unit of progress. Um, and other aspects of life, such as uh, your career or your personal life or your family life, like these things aren't finitely measurable. You can have some criteria to judge like if you're doing well or not, but it's all subjective and you can easily contort it in your mind without even thinking about it to skew it to to skew your like criteria to make you look like you're doing better or worse than you are. This is what I was getting into before about how you have to be honest with yourself. With games, you win or you lose. There's no gray line. So it's good for like personal development in that sense. And then we get, a, we get a cute little line, a quote from The Matrix Reloaded that says, you never truly know a man until you fight him. And um, I feel like this is actually placed a little bit earlier in the book than it needs to be. Uh, just remember that line, I'll come back to it in a minute. Do you want to win? Okay, and most people are gonna answer, yes, obviously I wanna win, but Winning doesn't exist in a vacuum, so the, the thing is that winning takes a lot of time and energy and commitment, which means sacrificing time that you could be giving to other areas of your life. This has personally impacted me like, greatly because um, there was a time in my life whenever I used to play a lot of Smash Brothers, and so I was working this crummy day job. Technically it was a night job and I'll, I would have to work 10 or sometimes 11 or 12 hours a day uh, just because that's what the job demanded. And then I would come home and I was preparing. I had like, I forget, like two or three months or something that I was preparing for the Smash tournament. It was going to be like a regional called Barrel Bash. And um, so I would work for 10 hours a day give or take, and then come home, and my goal was that I had to spend at least four hours a day practicing Smash after I got home. It hurt my relationship a lot with my girlfriend at the time. Notice I said at the time, you get to where the story is going. I would come home from work, and she would say, Joseph, come snuggle me, because uh, you know she was tired, she had a couple hours before she had to get up and go to work. So I would lay down with her for a half an hour or so, and um, when she fell asleep, I would come back out to the other room and practice some more. And she would say, then she would come out after a little bit, Joseph, why do you leave? And we, we got, we wound up getting into a lot of fights about this because I told her, look, I'm like, I need to practice. I need to practice. This is really important to me and I want to do well. Um, she didn't like it. We don't date anymore. There were other factors that led to us breaking up, but we got into a lot of fights over this. So it's a really real thing that competitive gaming is a huge time commitment and you have to decide if it's worth it for you personally. I don't know, I've got more stories I could tell like this. I probably don't need to dwell on it any longer than I already have. So let's just keep on trekking with the book. He says that some people wanna play a game for fun, quote unquote fun. But fun is a subjective thing that can't be really nailed down, so it's not within really the scope of the book. Because winning is finite, and that's what we're talking about. However, he, he gives him subtext, which I totally agree with, where he says that he finds playing to win fun, he finds like exploring the extreme cases of the game, and like just exploring it at a high level and having a conversation with your opponent to be like a lot more exciting than flailing around and not really knowing what's going on. Anyway, just know that fun isn't the main topic of the game, of the book, I mean, it's, it's winning. And uh, then he says that the principles of winning apply equally to all zero-sum competitive games. And so he's saying that you can play like Mario Kart, tennis, uh, chess, fencing, uh, SOCOM, is that, is that even still a game? You know, you can play any game competitively and 
there's certain theory that's going to apply to all of it. And now we come to this next heading, which is gaming as a conversation. Now, this is where the Matrix quote really comes into play. You never truly know a man until you fight him. And so he says that a competitive game is like a debate. You argue your points with your opponent, and he argues his. I think this series of moves is optimal, you say, and he retorts, not when you take this into account. And uh, we're going to delve a little bit more into this when we talk about Yomi later on. But games are like a debate. And I, I also, in a similar sort of vein, I would say that um, competing at a high level is like testing your values versus your opponent's values. And those are values in the game. They're not moral values. It's not like, I don't know, Christianity versus Judaism. It's not good versus evil. It's, it's like, I think that um, sacrificing a small amount of damage in my combo in order to maintain momentum and uh, potentially get a reset is stronger than um, doing a little bit more damage in my combo and um, having to replay the whole neutral game. What if I play Pokémon Tournament? This, this is what the game boils down to because I practice with Naga Strike and we're both damn good at that game. Let me tell you, we are fucking good at Pokémon Tournament. I made a uh, top 8 at CEO 2016 and he made a uh, top 16 at, uh, what was that tournament called? St. Louis Showdown. We're, we're good at this game. And we both play the same character, so... But we have very different play styles. And so, whenever we play against each other, it comes down to whose values and whose like play style is better a lot of the time. So gaming is like a debate, and gaming uh, tests your values in the game versus your opponent's values. So it's really like you get to you get to know each other when you play a game with somebody, like on a really intimate level, and that's really exciting just to think about. Back to the like debate analogy. He says that um, like a master debater is gonna know like be really intimately familiar with the tricks and traps that you can perform in his language to like get your opponent to slip and maybe say something that he doesn't actually intend to say. However, if you translate the the argument into a different language it doesn't always hold water but if you know the theory of the debate you're going to be able to argue in any language and so the language here the language is an analogy for the game if you know the theory of the game then you can compete at all games and so uh it's further giving credence to the previous paragraph where he was saying that um there's a general theory to games that applies to all games equally. This just gives further credence to that idea through this analogy. Let's talk about getting started. Obviously the first thing you have to do is choose a game and get involved in a community. And probably you already know what game that you want to play, maybe you don't, but most likely if you're looking up a video about how to improve at some competitive game, you already have a game in mind that you want to play. But let's say you don't, and you have to choose a game. And um, it says different games require different skills. And so obviously it's best to choose a game that like suits your personal skills best. However, to the beginner and even to the intermediate player, a lot of times it's difficult to know the actual skills required at the high level of play for a game because you just don't understand it well enough. He says that... There's, uh, you can play mature games like chess, for example, and those games, you can rest assured, are going to be very, like, rock solid at a high level of play. And other games that are newer games, it's hard to be so sure. Because some games at the high level of play become very degenerate, and other games maybe appear to be degenerate, but aren't actually when you know what's going on. So there's just risk involved picking a newer game. And that's really exactly what happened with uh, Smash Brothers Brawl. And the reason why nobody plays that and everybody still plays in Melee 
is because uh, as the games matured, Brawl is just a degenerate game and nobody plays it anymore, but Melee is eternal, you know. It holds the test of time. He also says that uh, you want to try and choose skill-based games. Um, games that require players to enter the game with equal materials. So, like uh, in a fighting game, for example, there are a whole bunch of different characters that you can choose from, and you might not be choosing the same character as your opponent, but you have the same choice to characters as your opponent. So, um, your material is essentially equal, it's just up to you to make the value call to say that I think this is the character that I want to play because it's like the best, or at least the best for me with my personal skill set. Some games aren't like that. Some games are like MMORPGs he, he cautions against. You don't want to play that kind of game because a lot of time, at least not competitively, and try to be high, very good at it because... It allows players to enter, like, they'll have more stats just because they grinded more. And so they automatically can enter a game with, like, bigger numbers than their opponent. And uh, it's not just about skill. So he cautions about finding a skill-based game to play. He also says, don't try to win at every game. Or at least don't play to win at every game. Because, um... Trying to like continually improve yourself and get better is, it's like a full-time job. Just trying to win, playing to win at one game is a full-time job. And at most, play to win two games. He says, you know, you can go out and enjoy a game of cards with your friends. That's fine. Maybe uh, once a week you play Boggle with your family. That's fine. Maybe like you meet up with your coworker after work and play chess, that's fine. But you have to know that um, you can't just spend all your time trying to improve at those games the same way that you would at like uh, League of Legends if that's the game you're trying to improve at and play to win at if your game is League. Spend all your time on League and if you're playing like Magic with your friends after school or like during your lunch period or something, that's fine and you can do everything in your power and with the knowledge that you have to try and win within the scope of the game but don't waste your time like trying to seek out mentors and find high level opponents to play and don't spend a lot of mental resources on trying to prove as much as you can at everything because you'll just spread yourself too thin and you won't win at anything and that's um that's an important caution to take. On to environment. And he says, creating an environment for yourself to play your game is vitally important. And I would agree. Um, I'm going to take a, this on a slight tangent. I uh, had a friend once named Ethan. Whenever Smash Wii U came out, he asked me would I uh, help him get better at Smash. And so we played every day for like two weeks. And he got really frustrated basically because his ass got whooped every day for two weeks. And um, so I quickly realized that what he needed was uh, a wider variety of opponents to play and people that um, he could win against or at least go even with. So we decided to um, we decided to start running Smash tournaments and we did it for every week for 14 weeks. If you want to get good, you, you need to find this sort of environment. You don't necessarily have to be the one hosting the event. But you need to find tournaments to go to. You need to find pe other people that play your game. You need to find online communities of people that know a lot of information about the game that can help you out. And you just need to network with other human beings and play the game with them. Because um, I love this line. Let me find it. The champion is forged in a fire, not in a vacuum. And uh, you always have to keep that in mind. You need to find a wide array, array of opponents to play against. And he says you have to have physical access to your game that can cannot be stressed enough so this means that if you play an arcade game you need to have an arcade near where you live um, to be able to play it or else like how are you going to improve if you play poker you need to have a card house in your area and you know the, the list goes on you can, I, you can go on for this 
with this idea forever, and he does. But you, you get the gist of it. He also says you need to have a lifestyle that allows you to, to uh, devote a lot of time to your game. And this is something right now that I'm struggling with a lot. And um, thinking about quitting my job because of it and finding a new job that doesn't force me to work for 12 hours a day. Personal baggage aside, uh, it's, it's really important that you spend a lot of time playing your game. And you also need to uh, play a game that you find fun because if you build your life around a game that feels like work, well then that's just a mistake. <laughs> frankly and let me let me tell you let me read you this quote because I think this is really cute building your life around any game is arguably a mistake but I'll pretend to ignore that point as it sure helps when it comes to winning <laughs> that's rich so then we move on to basic proficiency and so at the early stages excuse me at the early stages of uh, trying to learn any game the most important thing you can do is uh, just learn the basics you know, you want to learn the rules of the game. You want to learn, like, the jargon that's used, the lingo, uh, to describe different things in the game so that you actually know what people are talking about. And all this stuff doesn't actually require any expert help to uh, get to this point. But if you do have access to an expert player who can show you the rope, like, show you the ropes and um, point you to, like what you need to learn, how to improve, that's gonna really accelerate your pace. But at this point in the game, the expert isn't your opponent. You don't need to fight him because it's not going to help you that much. That's like what I was talking about with my friend Ethan and um, why it was like a mistake for us to always play because it was always too one-sided. He says that um, after you get to this basic stage of proficiency where you, you know where all what all your moves are and generally how to play the game and all the rules now you want to move on to learning the like quote unquote bread and butters the things that you can do to uh like easily win a game like the things that are easily executable and give you a shot at winning the goal is not to create new sequences that have never been seen before um, and this is like a really big point I want to drive home. The point is to be efficient, not develop sequences that nobody has seen before. I feel like a lot of people, when they get started playing a new game, they have this idea that they need to be like really innovative and bring something new to the world of the game and like blow people's minds. And that really isn't what you need to do. You have to focus on like the basics and the bread and butter stuff the stuff that's established and good because if you don't already know the basic stuff that's good how are you even going to know if what you're doing is like any better or worthwhile to do Th that's all going to come later you're not you're not at a stage of the game where you're ready to uh, be trying to innovate too much and he says uh, do not dwell too long on isolated laboratory practicing at this point anyway, because you needed to dive into real games and just get real experience playing a lot of games. And that's like really important. You just need to play as much as you can. And um, so he says that at this point in the development, in this point in your development anyway, some players will want to uh, only play the expert players and uh, basically their ass whooped over and over again. But he cautions against this. And he says that if you play against expert players, there is something to be learned. Uh, it'll teach you what not to do. It'll teach you uh, what moves or mistakes that you can get badly punished for and lose the game because of. But if you only remove moves from your repertoire, it doesn't teach you how to win. It only teaches you how to lose slowly. Instead, you should be looking at the expert players and watching what they do and how they close out games quickly and then you should look um, to play against weaker opponents like other beginners and, and even intermediate level players and try to practice those game winning tactics against them because they're going to give you a lot more openings to go for it than the expert player who's probably going to play much safer when you're in the early stages you want to 
you always want to play people your same skill level, you know, but eventually whenever you like master those sequences um, that can help you in games fast and whenever you're able to execute them without even thinking about it then you want to move up to the more expert players at this point you don't have a lot of use for weaker players I guess that sounds harsh <laughs> but you don't have a lot of use for them because you can develop bad habits if they let you do unsafe stuff and not punish you for it and you don't want to develop bad habits so he says, like the bottom line is you do want to transition to playing like the best players you can as much as you can, but don't do it at first. Wait till you're ready. That's the basic idea. That's pretty much all of what's uh, involved in the uh, beginner's guide. And as I said, a lot of that stuff is pretty, you know, common sense type stuff. But the next section here is the Intermediates Guide. And that's what we're going to get to uh, in the next uh, installment in this series. And that's when things are really going to get more interesting and probably make some people mad, give me some dislikes, and uh, <laughs> that'll be fun. So I don't know when, like how frequently I'm going to be able to do these Playing to Win videos. I'm wanting to shoot for every week, but I don't know if I actually realistically can make that happen because there's a lot of content that I want to bring to my channel and like relatively little time for me to record so it might be an every other week thing just uh, keep an eye on the channel and we'll see what happens uh, anyway until the next time I'll see you guys later